Welcome back. We're now going to start our series of lessons on the actual content for IB Computer Science. And we're going to be starting with A1.1, which is Computer Hardware and Operation. In this particular lesson, we're going to be looking at syllabus point A1.1.1, which basically states, describe the function and interaction of the main central processing unit CPU components. Before we begin with that, we need to understand what a CPU actually is. The central processing unit is often referred to as the brain of the computer. You'll probably find this definition in almost all books. It is a critical component that carries out the majority of the processing inside a device. So basically, it does all of the hard work. So whether you have your mobile phone, whether you have your television, whether you have your games console or a laptop computer or a desktop computer or an autonomous car, chances are that there's a CPU inside which coordinates all the processing that happens inside that particular device. Understanding the CPU generally involves exploring its core components, what their roles are and how they interact to perform computational tasks. So we're going to be looking at the CPU in a bit more depth today, and then we're going to move to other hardware like GPUs and so on. So the CPU is made up of two main units, the control unit, which is often abbreviated to CU, and the arithmetic logic unit, which is abbreviated to ALU. In addition, it uses a number of registers and buses to help it transfer data from a lot of different types of input and output devices. CPUs are normally designed using an architecture or a plan, and the most famous one is the von Neumann architecture, and that underpins most modern CPU design. Now on screen you see a diagram which shows you a CPU, which is then connected by various different buses to the RAM and I.O. devices, and the CPU consists of control unit, arithmetic logic unit, and various registers like the PC, MDR, MAR, and the accumulator. We're going to be looking at all of these in a moment as well. First, let's start with the ALU, which is a core component of a CPU. The arithmetic logic unit performs all mathematical operations, for example, addition, subtraction, and logical comparisons, and or not type of operations. Now, outputs are normally stored temporarily in registers, and the main register that the ALU uses is the accumulator. It can, however, write directly to memory as well if needs be, but generally everything is saved in the accumulator, and once a calculation is completed, it is then written to memory. Now, this is the part where most of the computation or the maths actually happens. Each of these can get your points in the exam, so make sure that you are aware of these. The control unit is the other core component, and it normally decodes instructions and activates the correct hardware by sending control signals. It directs the fetch, decode, execute cycle, and we'll be looking at that in a moment as well, and it sends control signals to coordinate actions between the CPU, memory, and the input and output devices. Basically, it manages the flow of data and instructions inside a particular device. Now, to help the CU and the ALU do whatever they need to do, there are a lot of different registers. And registers are small capacity, very fast memory locations, normally used to hold instructions, addresses, or data during the execution phase temporarily. So they don't store things very long term. They just simply store them temporarily so the CU or the ALU can do whatever they need to do. And there are a number of registers which have various different purposes. So we start by looking at the first one, which is program counter or PC. Now this holds the address of the next instruction. For example, in RAM, there would be address 1001, and that's where you need to go to start the program, and that address may be stored in the program counter. The instruction register stores the current instruction being executed. So when you go to the first address, which is 1001 in RAM, and it might have an input command, and you then take that command and store it in the instruction register. Now for that storage to happen, two other registers come into play. The first one is the memory address register, which holds the address in memory to be read from or written to. And the second one is the memory data register, MDR, which temporarily holds data moving in and out of memory. So one will be the memory address location, the other one will be the data that needs to be read from or written to. So in our case, 1001, which is the address in RAM, is stored in MAR, 
and the input instruction which is loaded from the RAM and has to go to the instruction register is stored in the MDR and both of these work side by side. And finally accumulator is the register that is used by the arithmetic and logic unit and it stores intermediate results of arithmetic and logic operations. Make sure you are aware of these registers and what they actually do. It is very important for you to remember those common exam questions. The next critical component of a computer system are buses. And buses are used to transfer data between various devices, including the CPU, memory, storage, and various different peripherals. You can think of them as communication pathways, which transfer data between various different components. Buses have widths that are normally measured in bits, and the bigger the width of the bus, the more data it can transmit at one time. There are three main buses that we're going to be looking at, the data bus, the address bus, and the control bus. Let's start by looking at the data bus. The data bus carries data that is being processed between the CPU, memory, and other peripherals. And the width of this bus is really important because that determines the amount of data that can be transferred at one time. So common bus widths are 8 bits, 16, 32, 64, and so on. The bigger the bus, the more data that can be transmitted. Now often the bus can act as a bottleneck. For example, you could have a 64-bit CPU, but if it's only got a 32-bit address bus, that means the CPU might need to wait two cycles to get all the data needed for processing. Next up is the address bus, and the address bus is used to transmit the address that is to be read from or written to in memory. The width of this bus determines the memory capacity of the system. For example, a 32-bit address bus can have 2 to the power of 32 memory locations accessible at one particular time. So if you, for example, have a 4 GB RAM chip, all the addresses could be accessed in one particular cycle. However, if you got an 8 GB one, then you would need to use two cycles or get a motherboard with a bigger bus. Now the data bus is known as a bidirectional bus because it can transmit data in both directions, send data to RAM and receive from RAM. The address bus is a unidirectional bus because it can only transmit addresses to RAM. It cannot receive addresses from RAM. So be aware of that. Address bus is a unidirectional bus and the data bus is a bidirectional bus. The control bus is the final bus that we're going to be looking at and that is used to transmit command and control signals from the CPU to all the other components and vice versa. So interrupts come back to the CPU and its control signals are transmitted from the CPU. So this bus is also bidirectional. Some of the signals that would be transmitted by the control bus are read and write operations like read from memory, write to memory, interrupt requests clock signals for synchronization, and status signals from various different hardware components. Now, all these core components interact with each other and the various different devices as part of the fetch, decode, execute cycle. You will see this cycle mentioned a lot in exam questions, and it is a cycle that is continuous in operations for as long as the CPU is switched on. So when a program runs, the CPU performs this fetch, decode, execute cycle. In the fetch stage, the PC, or the program counter, sends the address of the instruction to the memory address register. So it says, okay, this is the next instruction. Please could you fetch data or the next instruction from this? And it copies this into the MAR. The instruction is then retrieved via the address buses and data buses, and it's loaded into the MDR. And from the MDR, it's copied into the instruction register, which is how the control unit accesses whatever it needs to do. The control unit will then interpret this instruction and it is going to look in an instruction table and say okay this is what's in the instruction register and I need to find out how to work with it. So it looks in the table and then it says aha I need to add a number, I need to divide it, I need to subtract it and so on. So the interpretation of that instruction happens between the control unit and the instruction register. And finally, the execution occurs, which is when the ALU performs any needed operations, possibly using data from the MDR or storing results in the accumulator. All of that happens in the execution stage. So the calculation occurs and the result is stored somewhere either in the accumulator and then eventually transferred back into RAM. And these steps are repeated rapidly, often billions of times per second. 
Now, CPUs don't just come in one variety. There are often lots of different types of configurations, and these include single core processors, multi core processors, and co processors. So, let's start by looking at single core processors. These type of CPUs only have a single processing unit, meaning it can only handle one task at a time. And these are more often found in low level, entry level computers or older machines. They're adequate for simple tasks. Single core processors are able to run more than one application, so they can do multitasking, but this single core or the CPU has to be shared between those applications, and therefore performance can be impacted. Now, multi core processors overcome that bottleneck. So, a CPU with multi core processors has two or more cores that can run multiple instructions simultaneously. These are often referred to as dual core, two processors, quad core, four processors, hexa core six, or octa core eight, and so on. Now, their performance is significantly faster than single core processors, and they're ideal for multitasking, gaming, and server based applications. However, software has to be written to take advantage of these extra cores. If you have older software, which does not work with multi-core processors, therefore it will run at a similar speed as compared to a single core processor. Core processors, on the other hand, are a special type of processor that has a specific job to support the main CPU. And these are built with distinct purposes to achieve optimal performance compared to, say, a general purpose CPU. Tasks can be offloaded by the CPU to the core processor so they can run in parallel. So think about like, machine learning algorithms or graphics processing, and these can be often offloaded so the CPU doesn't handle that type of work and it is processed simultaneously to the core instructions of a program. So examples of coprocessors include GPUs, audio processors, digital signal processors, machine learning algorithm processors, and so on. A common mistake here is thinking that adding more CPU cores always makes a computer faster. For example, a dual core CPU is twice as fast as a single core. This isn't always true because the speed increase depends on how well the software can use multiple cores at the same time. Often programs aren't designed to take full advantage of multiple cores, so the extra cores may not make a noticeable difference. Other factors including memory speed and how the CPU is designed, communication pathways, also impact core performance. Okay, that's all there is for the CPU side of things for the moment. On screen, you will probably see a few practice questions. The way these questions work is that you'll probably be able to find the answers in the lesson video, either in the text or in my audio. So the plan is that you probably will have an exercise book where you'll be answering these questions and normally your teacher will check it, or you can post the answers in the comments and I can check it and or the community can check it for you. I will not give the answers to these type of questions because that defies the purpose of learning and the videos. So the core goal is to understand the lesson and then apply your knowledge to answer these questions. And the mark points will give you an idea of how many points I'm looking for a particular answer. Okay, that's all there is for this particular video. I'll see you in the next one.